We begin a, a, a brand new series today that is just four weeks, uh, and we're, we're calling it Our Gifts in Christ, Our Gifts in Christ, and we'll begin that today, and it'll carry us through uh, Sunday, December the 26th, and so I hope that you'll make it a habit and a pattern if you're here in this area and you're in town to uh, come back each and every Sunday and to figure out what gifts you have been given in Christ. I think you'll find this study to be really helpful and it'll be a blessing to you. We'll begin today in 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. And we're going to look at just one verse, but I want you to keep your Bible handy. We'll be using it some as we move throughout the message this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse number 9. A familiar passage of Scripture, but let's look at it together. The Bible says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Isn't that a great verse? That's a wonderful verse. I, I think, if I remember correctly, the first sermon I ever preached was from this particular passage of Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse number 9. So it holds a very special place in my heart. My dad, who is also a preacher, uh, has, uh, as folks have asked for him in times past, maybe to sign their Bible so that they can remember to pray for him, and he's put his name in their Bible, and he always puts this verse underneath it, 2 Corinthians 8 and verse number nine. It's a wonderful verse. In fact, I think we ought to do this. Why don't we read it together? You've got your Bible there. For those of you that maybe don't have a Bible, maybe just sit and listen, uh, and, uh, or maybe you can pull one up there on your cell phone so that you can read along with us. But let's read that verse together. Let's pause where there's some commas and some punctuation, and, uh, and, and, and let's just take all that this verse has in for us here this morning. Would you join me in reading that verse? Here we go, ready? For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that... Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You know what that is? That's the gospel all in one verse. You know, there's a few verses in the Bible that are like that. I think of John chapter 3 and verse number 16. I mean, the whole gospel message, it's sort of the Bible in a nutshell. And, and 2 Corinthians 8 and verse number 9 is, is very similar to that. I mean, just one sentence, God gives us the whole gospel. Now, think about this. I'm going to speak to you this morning for 30 minutes or so. And some of you are saying, we wish it was only going to be 30 minutes that you're going to speak to us this morning. We'll do our best to try to keep it within that time frame. And I'm going to say a lot, and I'll never say, I'll never say as much as what is written in this one verse with 25, 30 words or so. Think about that for a moment. What an amazing Bible we have. What a great God we have who has given us his word. This morning, with the Lord's help, I want to preach to you on this very first the message in this series, the gifts that we have in Christ, I want to preach this, this subject. Christ gives us his wealth. Christ gives us his wealth. You know, the Friday after Thanksgiving is known as Black Friday, and it is the, uh, it's known as the busiest in-person shopping day of the year. And uh, some of you are crazy enough to go out on Black Friday and take your chances with the crowd and with all of the people that are shopping. And the reason you do that is because stores are offering, oftentimes are offering really, really good deals. And so you can get something really good and really special for not a whole lot of money. And so Black Friday, day after Thanksgiving, is known as the busiest shopping day of the year in person. This past Monday uh, is known as Cyber Monday. And uh, of course, it is the most lucrative online shopping day of the year. And a lot Lots of great deals that are found on the various websites and various places along those lines. And of course, most of the shopping that is done on these two days, and really will be done over the next two and a half or so weeks, most of that shopping is done for the express purpose of gift giving during the Christmas season. And, and, uh, and, and, and we understand that. And, and you know, I, I, was, I was studying, preparing for this message, and I, I'm given to understand that there's really not uniform agreement among, among people as to where this culture, this tradition, this custom of gift giving began. Uh, in other words, uh, there's a lot of disagreement. Did it begin here? Did it begin there? Uh, some say that it began uh, when the Magi or the wise men brought the gifts to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there in Bethlehem, as far as we, we understand it from Matthew chapter number two, they came when he was a young boy. Some believe that maybe he was as old as two years old. 
Uh, the Bible indicates that at that time he was living in a home. He was no longer there in the manger. Oftentimes you have a nativity set and you'll find the shepherds are there and the wise men are there bearing their gifts. But, it, but, but from what we read in Matthew chapter number two, he's a young boy and he's now living in a home. And imagine the stir that must have caused in the neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, here are, here are these men that have come from afar. And, um, and if we believe the biblical narrative, the Bible indicates that Jesus was born. He was born into a family where his, his, his earthly father was not his real father, but his earthly father was a carpenter. He was just a builder. He just had a normal trade. He was not a man of wealth, and we would assume that he probably lived, especially as transients, that Bethlehem was not their original home. Uh, we assume that in the time that they were there, they probably lived in a pretty modest home in a pretty modest neighborhood. And one, one day, all of a sudden, here come these men traveling from the east. They probably have a caravan with them. They're probably, they're, they're probably wearing the finest clothes, and they come bearing gifts fit for a king, and they present them to this little boy who lives in a very modest, maybe even even a poverty-stricken part of town. Here you go, here you go, little guy. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That had to have caused quite a stir in the neighborhood, don't you think? I mean, who is this kid living over here? All this time, we just thought he was just a normal kid, he was the son of this carpenter, and one day, all of these people come from a far country, and they're bearing gifts. And so some believe, some believe that that's where, that's where the tradition of gift giving at Christmas began. Uh, I, I would propose to you that in, in many respects, the, the greatest gift that is ever given was given at Christmas time, right? When God sent his only son into this world, the Bible tells us that God gave his only begotten son, and I can't think of a greater or a better gift than that. But listen, regardless of how the practice originated, we understand that it is part of our, of our custom, our, our traditions, and our culture uh, to, uh, to give gifts during this season. And I would say probably most of us are, are grateful for that because we have some fond memories throughout our lives of great gifts that we've been given. I uh, I have encountered throughout my life various gift givers. Uh, as a child growing up, I always felt like the best gifts that I received at Christmas came from my parents. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they were always the best gift givers. Uh, the reason, I, I think I've thought on this, the reason I think that that's the case is because they lived with us. And they, and they knew, they knew from, uh, from, from just normal conversation and daily life, they knew the things that we wanted or perhaps maybe the things that we, that we needed. I can remember, I can remember sometimes like, wanting a certain gift and not getting it on Christmas Day from my parents and thinking, you know, man, how did they miss that? I've been dropping clues right and left, and, you know, I circled that in the Sears catalog and, and uh, put my little initials next to it. How did they miss that? And, uh, and then we would go, we'd go to my grandma's house, and, um, and I'd open the present, and there it was, and I thought to myself, now, now they pulled a sly trick on me, you know, and, and I, sometimes I'd watch my parents exchange glances with my grandparents, like, see, we told you was going to like it. And, and even, even the gifts that came from my grandparents, oftentimes they came through my parents because of the relationship that we had together and that we, that we enjoyed. Now as, a, now as a married man, I find that the best, the best gifts I get are from my wife. Now, my wife has this incredible ability to remember some bizarre comment that I made like in the month of July. She like files it away in her mind. She tucks it away and she remembers. Here's how pathetic I am. She will text me things like three days before Christmas and I'll still fail to get those gifts. And she made it that abundantly clear. And here I am dropping these weird bizarre hints throughout my life. And she just, she just remembers and, and, and it shows up there on, on Christmas morning. Uh, you know, I, I find again the best gifts I receive are from those who are, who are closest to me. And that got me to thinking, you know, what makes a great gift and what makes a, a great gift giver? Well, I think there's three components that go into a great gift coming from a great gift giver. I, I would say, number one, the first component is, component is a need or a want, something that I specifically need or that I specifically want. Now, I, I've, had, I've had wonderful people in this church give me candy. Now, I may want that. I certainly don't need it. <laughs> You know that as well as I do. I, I love it. I appreciate it. But, but you know that I probably don't need any more of that. That's probably not maybe the best thing, the best thing for me. But a, but a need or a, or a want, something that would, 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 would help me. You know, you know, as you live life, there are, there are times in which you discover a product, maybe you've seen it on television or online, in which you, as you reflect on it, as you think on it, you say, boy, if I had that, it sure would make my life a whole lot easier. 
Maybe it's some home improvement product or maybe it's a tool for some of you men or maybe it's some product that could be used in the kitchen that if you had that available to you, it would cut off quite a bit of time in the project that you're working on. And, and, uh, and so there, there's, that, there's that need or, or there's that, that want. I would say that a good gift starts here. Something that you've noticed that is missing in your life. That boy, if I had this, it would make life a whole lot easier, a whole lot better. But then the second, the second component of a great gift is a relationship, someone that's close enough to you with, in relationship to observe that need or that want. That's why in my mind I'm thinking to myself, well, now I know why my parents were the best gift givers because they lived with me. They, 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 saw, they saw that my, you know, my, my sweatshirt was kind of getting a little old and a little raggedy, and so they understood that. They observed me closely. They saw that there were holes in my socks or holes in my shoes or you know, that maybe I'd outgrown the belt that they'd gotten me the year before. And They were close enough to me to observe these things and to, and to notice these things. The closeness of the relationship, again, sometimes enables us to, to pick up on little clues or little hints or to, to pick up on needs that are either observed just by observation, we see this, or needs that are actually stated. Boy, it sure would be nice if I had this tool or it sure would be nice if I had a new tie or a new pair of shoes or whatever the case might be. And the best gift givers are those who are close enough to you in relationship to hear those types of, of, of requests and, or, or to, to, to see those types of things and, and, to, and, to, and to act upon it. But then I thought there's a third component. And that is, that is the ability or the wherewithal to meet that need or that want. Uh, my son is eight years old and and over the last, I don't know, over the last year or so, he has developed a real fascination and obsession with Teslas. You, you know what I'm talking about, a Tesla car. And I'm not exactly sure. I think they're really cool, but I'm not exactly sure how practical they are. On a road trip, you know, I mean, you stop for gasoline and you fill up in 10 minutes and you're moving on. And, and a Tesla, I, I think it, it takes an hour or so to charge the thing and get you 250 miles down the road. And I'm not exactly sure just how practical they are, but he's obsessed. I mean, every, every day he is on the lookout and I'm driving down the road and he's sitting in the back seat. He's eight years old and he'll shout from the back, dad, a Tesla. And I'm going, where, where? I'm looking all over, you know? And sure enough, I mean, he, he has the ability to spot a Tesla like a mile away. It's unbelievable. There have been times where I was like, that is not a Tesla. Yes, it is a Tesla. I'm sorry, buddy. You know, I was, I was wrong and you were right. Somebody working down here at Sam's Club at the end of the street, they own a Tesla. It's parked there every single day. And I'm telling you, it makes his day. Every time we drive by there, there it is, dad. There must be working today. And, and, uh, and I mean, just, just obsessed with Teslas. Now, I am, um, I am his father. Therefore, I'm close enough to pick up on the fact that he has a fascination with that. I, I, I can see that. But I must tell you that I do not have the wherewithal or the ability to meet that need in his life or that want, maybe we ought to say. In other words, if he ever gets a Tesla, it ain't going to be from his mother and his father. All right? He's going to buy that on his own or marry somebody who's rich or whatever the case might be. But it's not going to come from us on Christmas morning. So, so the point that I'm trying to make is a great gift is the need, a, a closeness in relationship to be able to pick up on the fact that that's a need or that's a want. And then the, the final component is do I have the ability, do I have the financial wherewithal to be able to provide or to meet that need? And and, uh, and, and, and I would say, I would propose to you that that is what makes a great gift and a great gift giver. Now, over the next several weeks, I want us to observe the gifts that we have in Christ. In other words, we're going to consider the spiritual treasures and the spiritual gifts that he has placed into our hands. And here's what's interesting. These things are needs. They're needs that every man has, whether he acknowledges them or not. And can I say this, that, that in all of this universe, in all of this world, Christ alone, and don't lose sight of that, Christ alone is, is the only one who is capable of meeting these needs for you. In other words, you know, as it relates to a, a Christmas gift, I told you, you know, that, that I got to a point where I said, okay, well, if I don't get this from my parents, maybe I'll get it from my grandparents. And if I don't get it from my grandparents, maybe I'll get it from this person or from that person. But I want you to know something, listen, there's only one person, there is only one person who can provide or meet the needs that we're gonna look at in scripture that you have. His name is Jesus Christ. And can I also say this, listen, these gifts, these gifts are available to every man who responds to God by faith. 
In other words, you may, you may be here this morning and, and you may say, well, you know, that, those gifts are nice in theory and I'm, I'm sure they're available to some people, but they, they can't possibly be available to me. I'm here to tell you that these gifts are available to every man. Every man. Christ makes these gifts available to, to us. We're going to begin today by considering Christ giving us or gifting us with his wealth. Christ gifting us with his wealth. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, just to give you a little bit of context before we dive into the outline, uh, Paul is, 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 is trying to use the believers in Macedonia sort of like this, this, this prod or this rod to, to encourage or to urge the church at Corinth to give liberally, to give sacrificially and generously to an offering he was collecting for the saints in Jerusalem. So understand this, listen, giving, giving is, is, not a, is not a 2021 type of of a concept. No, no, giving goes all the way back to the New Testament. Uh, Paul, that's, that's, that's the context behind this chapter. He's, he's talking about a, a, a collection that he's taking for the saints who lived in Jerusalem. The Bible says in Romans 15, verses 25 and 26, but now I go unto Jerusalem, this is Paul writing, to minister unto the saints. And we see that, that word minister, and we, we think oftentimes certainly of a spiritual ministering, but I think it was more than that. I think, I think that Paul was planning not only to minister to the spiritual needs among the saints in Jerusalem, but he also had a heart to minister to their physical needs, or we might say their carnal needs, if I can say that without... without uh, an appropriate thought, just the physical daily needs that they had in, 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 in helping them in, in body and, and in home. Many of the believers there, because of their faith and because they lived in the epicenter of Judaism, which was also the epicenter of persecution, many of them had lost their jobs, had lost their homes, some had been in prison, some had even lost their lives because of their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul had it within his heart, he had a burden to be a blessing to the saints that were at Jerusalem. And so he says, I'm going. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to minister their needs. He says, for he hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And so Paul is writing here in 2 Corinthians 8, and he is saying, listen, listen, church at Corinth, I want you to be a part of this offering. And he's, and he's using, it's interesting, he's using the churches of Macedonia as sort of this in some respects, he's sort of shaming them or guilting them into digging a little bit deeper than they maybe normally would. He says in the beginning of this chapter, he says in verse number one, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit or to have knowledge of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that at a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. You know what he's saying? He's saying, he's saying listen, Church of Corinth, let me tell you about, let me tell you about these believers of Macedonia. Well, they have next to nothing. I mean, they're in a great trial of affliction, and yet, and yet look what they've done. You know what he's saying? He's saying, church at Corinth, if, if the churches of Macedonia can give what they gave, imagine what you can do. Boy, you have an obligation. You have a responsibility to dig deep and to, and to give liberally. But then, but then, he, then he changes, he changes the, the narrative just a little bit. And in verse number nine, he, 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 he stops he stops encouraging them using the churches of Macedonia. And he says, well, let me give you the greatest reason that any of us should give liberally to begin with. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse number nine, he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. In other words, you know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, if the churches of Macedonia don't encourage you to give liberally and to give generously, will the Lord Jesus Christ do it? I mean, to think about what Jesus has given to you and has given to me, shouldn't we in turn be willing to be as generous and as liberal as we possibly can be in our giving and in our lives? And that really is the context for this particular text. Now, I want us to notice that the scriptures reveal just how it is that Christ gives us of his wealth. I want you to notice, number one, as we consider our text this morning, we, we think about our greatest need our greatest need. What is, your, what is your greatest need? What is mankind's greatest need? I think it's identified in this verse. Look what it says in verse number nine. It says that, that ye through his power, very end of the verse, might be rich. You know what your, you know what your greatest need? I'm gonna, I'm, gonna blow, I'm gonna blow your mind here today. I'm gonna tell you that your greatest need is to be wealthy. Some of you are sitting here saying, man, I knew it. I knew it. I've thought that for the longest time, and I've been waiting for a preacher to agree with me on that. My greatest need is to be rich, is to be wealthy. 
Now before, now before you get too, too far down the road here, let me explain to you what I mean by that. When I talk about your greatest need being to be rich, I want you to understand we're, we're, not, we're not just, we're, we need to think beyond dollars and cents. We need, we need to think beyond bank accounts and, and we need to think beyond retirement accounts and 401ks and, and the property and houses and lands. We, we, we need to think way, way beyond that because when he says here in verse number nine that ye might be rich, he is not talking about that in any way, shape, or form. He's not talking about worldly wealth or financial wealth. He is speaking, listen, he's speaking of eternal riches. So here's what, here's what, here's what you need. Your greatest need is to be eternally rich. Not to be financially rich or financially wealthy, but your greatest need is to be, is to be eternally rich. You know, there are things in this life that money cannot buy. Money, money, can't, money can't buy you good health. I, um, I spent a lot of time in hospitals. I spent a lot of time in funeral homes and preaching funerals and with families who have just lost loved ones. I, I see death a lot. And you know, can, can, you, can you just uh, reason with me and understand that, that it's not just poor people who die. Wealthy people die too. It's, it's, not just, it's not just unknown people who get, who, get, who get difficult diseases. I heard just this week of a theologian that many of you would know his name. He's an author, and he just, he just tweeted out this week that he's been diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. He's a very well-known preacher and teacher. I wouldn't agree with him on, uh, on everything. In fact, there'd be a lot of things I wouldn't agree with him on, but we all know his name. And I'm just simply saying, here's a man who is, who is, who is w- widely known in Christian circles. I'm not widely known. If I, if I were to tweet out that I had stage four p- pancreatic cancer, would, it would affect the people in this church and maybe some of my preacher friends, but the, the, the masses of humanity wouldn't know who I am. But I just want you to know something. It doesn't matter who you are. Money cannot buy you health. Money, money can't buy you happiness. You know, I'm amazed. I'm continually amazed as I observe, you know, the happenings in, 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 in among, among celebrities. Maybe that's the word that we ought to use. I'm talking about athletes, and I'm talking about uh, Hollywood stars, many of them who are on their fourth, fifth, sixth marriage. I mean, they've sought, they've sought happiness in, 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 in every relationship you can imagine. It's never provided that for them. Listen, money cannot, money cannot buy you happiness. It cannot buy you health. So, so I want you to understand something. There are some things in this world that are vitally important that money can never purchase for you or can never provide for you. Can I say that these, these things that I'm speaking of happen to be some of our greatest needs? Let me share, let me share three eternal needs that you have you can write them down in the bulletin that you have in front of you if, you if you picked one up. Number one is the forgiveness of sin. You need to be rich in this area, knowing that all of your sins are forgiven. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. We might, we might hear that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we might think, well, that's really not that big of a deal. But according to the Bible, it's a very big deal. Because the wages of sin is death. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. James 1, 15 says that when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You know, it's amazing. The world, the world looks at sin as it's really not that big of a deal. Now, there's certain sins that the world gets caught up in is understanding that they're very, very serious. I'm thinking what tragically unfolded in the state just to the north of us this last week in Michigan at the, I think it's the Oxford High School, in which a young man, 15 years old, went into that school and, and shot and killed, I think, three of his classmates or four of his classmates. A tragic thing in the world. The world looks at that and says, that's a really, really big deal. But I want you to know something. God looks at all sin and says it's a really big deal. Not just certain sins. Not just certain things that grab the, 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 the media's uh, headlines and the attention of the entire world. No, no, listen, your sin and my sin, the mundane things that we don't really think are that big of a deal, God looks at them and God says that the wages of those sins is death. We read the scriptures and we discover again that God has a completely different viewpoint of sin and its seriousness than we do. Therefore, therefore, listen, the man who has his sins forgiven I want you to know something. That's a man who has a wealth the world, the vast majority of the world knows nothing of. 
I mean, the man who, 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 who has all of his sins under the, uh, under the blood of Christ and they've been atoned and he's been redeemed, the world knows little about that. That man is wealthy in, in, in eternal riches. I think not only of the forgiveness of sins, but I think about the peace with God. Peace with God is a need that each and every one of us has in this life and in the life to come. Did you know, did you know that, when you were, that when you were born, when I was born, every one of us, we were born separated from God and we were born in, 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 at war with God? The Bible teaches that. Romans 8 and verse number 7, the Bible says, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. James 4 and verse number 4, the Bible says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So listen, listen, you and I are born, listen, we are born separated from God. We are born dead in our sin and in our wickedness, and we, listen, we are born at war with Almighty God. Now when I think about peace, a, I, I want to be honest with you. I want to be at peace with everyone. I don't, like, I don't like the feeling that somebody is upset with me or that I've offended someone or that I've hurt someone with my words or my deeds and actions. And I, I hate that. I want to, I if I can, I want to try to make that right. But listen, listen, as you seek peace with, with, in your life and with people, can I, can I re- urge and can I recommend that you seek peace with God first and foremost? I believe that's the, that's the most vital need that you have. And by the way, I believe when you find peace with God, you'll also discover it organically with other people. That peace with God enables us to have peace with our fellow man. I want you to know not only do we have the need of the forgiveness of sin to be rich in that area, but we have the need of peace with God to be rich in peace with God, but we also have the need for an eternal home in heaven did you know that, that, that when you were born, when I was born, every one of us, not only were we born at war with God, being at enmity with him, but we were also born on a highway that leads to a place the Bible calls the lake of fire. Just this week, I had a man, a friend of mine who texted me. He used to attend this church. He no longer lives in this area. But he said, I, I want to know what your thoughts are on a, on a term, a concept that is known as annihilationism. I had heard the term before, and, and, and I, I've, not, I've not spent a lot of time studying it or looking into it, but I knew what it meant, and I just wanted to clarify with him. I said, do you mean, do you mean that, that annihilationism being that when a person dies that, the, that is lost, they do not know Jesus Christ their Savior, that God just, just destroys them, that they, don't have, they do not have to suffer for all of eternity in a place the Bible calls the lake of fire? And he says, that's exactly what I mean. He says, I'm reading a book right now, and the author seems to be leading into this concept, and he goes, I've never really heard of it, and I wanted to know what you think of it. And I'll tell you what I think of it. I think it's a bunch of baloney. And I think it's a bunch of baloney because the Bible never talks about it. In fact, the Bible talks about a place called the lake of fire. The Bible says that it is a place of suffering, that it is a place where the worm dies not and where the fire is never quenched. And I want you to know something. According to the scripture, every man, every man who's ever born is born on a highway to that place. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, in verse number 3, that Jesus is speaking and he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So he must make a decision. He must be born again if he's going to see the kingdom of God. The Bible says in John 3, 36, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And I just want to proclaim to you that every person who's ever been born, some maybe even who are sitting in this room this morning, you are on a highway, a wide highway that leads to a place called hell or the lake of fire. And I just want you to know something. There is only one exit to get you off of that highway. And that exit is to believe on the Son. That exit is to be born again, to place your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way to get off of that highway and to be guaranteed that you have an eternal home in heaven. And so listen, every one of us that is born, we are born poor. And we are born poverty stricken as it relates to per- forgiveness of sin, as it relates to peace with God, as it relates to an eternal home in heaven. We do not have these things. We cannot have these things. They are impossible to us except, except for Jesus Christ who has done what he has done for us. And I want you to understand that's our greatest need. But notice secondly, we consider, as we've talked about in the introduction, we consider the need or the want being a part of a great gift. But I want you to consider with me Christ's acknowledgement of our need. Remember we said that in order for the, for the gift to come to fruition, there's a need or there's a want. And then there's someone, listen, there's someone who is close enough to you to observe that you have that need and you have that want. 
And I want you to notice that Jesus Christ is that person. Brother was saying read just a moment ago as we began the service, Matthew 1, 21. And the Bible says that she, speaking of Mary, shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. The name Jesus, it literally means Savior. And here's why, here's why that would be his name, for he shall save his people from their sins. I was reminded as I was preparing for this message of the third verse of the familiar Christmas carol, Good Christian Men Rejoice. I will not sing that for you, but I will quote it for you. It says, Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Why? Because Jesus Christ was born to save. What a, what a beautiful, beautiful verse that encapsulates the life of Christ. And I want you to know something. His birth in a manger is a, is a, is a bold, dramatic statement to us. Here's what, here's what it says. It says this. He knows what our greatest need is and that he has come to meet this need. The angel announced to Joseph that Mary was going to have a son, even though she was still a virgin. That this son was to, be given, was to be given the name Jesus. That means Savior, for he would save his people. And I want you to know something. This salvation was not a political salvation. This salvation was not a fun, financial salvation. This salvation was not a social salvation or any other type of salvation. This salvation was spiritual. Now, here's the question. How did... How did he know? How did he know that this was our greatest need? How did he know that? Here's how he knew that. Because he had observed us throughout history. I'm talking about mankind as a whole. You say, what did he observe? Well, I share with you three things. Number one, he observed Adam's fall. He observed Adam's fall. I want you to hold your place in 2 Corinthians 8. And would you go with me to Colossians, please? Colossians chapter number one. Just a couple of, of, of books removed from where we were there in 2 Corinthians and I want to prove to you that Christ Jesus observed Adam's fall there in the garden. Look what the Bible says in verse number 12. Paul is writing and he says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So verses 12 and 13, who are they talking about? They're talking about the Father, right? We're giving thanks to the Father. Here's why. Because he's done these things. But notice, notice he transitions from talking about the Father in verses 12 and 13, and he begins to talk about the kingdom of his dear Son in verses 14 and beyond. So when he introduces the concept of the kingdom of his dear Son, understand, okay, this is what the kingdom looks like, and this is what the dear Son has done, and what he has provided. Verse number 14, in whom, in whom, who, in, in whom his dear Son, we have redemption through his blood. I want you to know something. The Father didn't shed his blood, the Son did. So, so verse number 14 and beyond, we're now talking about his dear Son. We're talking about Jesus, the Son of God, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now look at verse number 16. For by him, who? The dear Son. For by him, by the dear Son, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him. Who? The dear Son. And for him. Who? The dear Son. And he is before all things. Who is before all things? The dear Son is before all things. And by him all things consist. So listen, don't miss this. He's talking about the dear Son in verses 14 and beyond. So what does he say? He says that the dear son of God created all things. You know, there's, there are some that believe that God the Father created all things, including God the Father created God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. The Bible never teaches that. The Bible teaches that, that, that Jesus is eternal just as God the Father is eternal. And that the Holy Spirit is eternal just as God the Father and God the Son are eternal. And, and, and listen, if Jesus, the dear son, if he created man, then, then, then we would understand this, that he was there to observe man's fall, don't you suppose? There in the Garden of Eden as Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent and they were tempted by the fruit that was forbidden to them, Jesus watched, he observed, as both of them took as big of a bite out of that fruit, whatever it might have been, as humanly possible. He watched as their eyes were open so that they could discern between good and between evil. They recognized that they were naked and they tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. That God, listen, God the Son, Jesus Christ, he observed man's fall in the garden. 
He saw it. Why? He's the creator. I mean, he created them. He was the one who put Adam to sleep and removed the rib from Adam's side and created the woman and brought her unto the man. He was there for all of those things. He was there on day one when he spoke into existence the heavens and the earth. He was there on day two and day three and all the way through. Jesus, listen, Jesus, the son, was there as he observed in Genesis chapter three, Adam's fall in the garden. Notice not only did he observe Adam's fall in the garden, but he also observed man's swift demise. Genesis 3, it's just taking a bite of a piece of fruit that, that they weren't supposed to, to have. But I want you to see how quickly things degenerated. Would you, would you go with me very quickly to Genesis 6? We're six chapters into the history of mankind. We're three chapters into the history of mankind cursed and stained by sin. And I want you to see how, how bad it got and how quickly it got that bad. Would you look with me in Genesis 6? Look what the Bible says in verse number five, and God saw, there it is. That's the observation. A great gift giver, he observes, she observes some things about the person they want to give a gift to. God saw, what do you see? He saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. My soul, what a swift demise. We see, we see that not only did he observe Adam's fall, but he observed man's swift demise just six chapters in. Three chapters later that man has been cursed by sin. I realize a great period of time has happened, but you get the idea. It didn't take very long for them to get to this point. The Bible says that every thought of man was tainted by sin and by wickedness and by evil that he did not have within him the ability to think a pure thought. Every thought was perverted, it was evil, and it was wickedness, and God saw it. He saw how quickly sin had marred and had destroyed this earth and this creation that he had made. He saw all of those things. Let me ask you this question. If it took three chapters for man to get where, where he is in Genesis 6, is it any surprise that we're dealing with the things that we're dealing with today. It really should not shock us. It really shouldn't for a young man to carry a gun into a school and kill people. Because I'm just telling you, listen, man apart from God is a mess. Man apart from God, just three chapters apart from God and, and, and cursing and doing, being, being cursed by sin and doing all the things that are associated, and we find, we find man's life is an absolute mess. God observed these things. He saw Adam's fall. He observed man's swift demise. But can I say thirdly, he also observed man's complete and utter helplessness. See, here's what God determined to do. He chose a faithful man. His name was Abraham. We're introduced to him in Genesis chapter number 12. Abraham was faithful, and, and God said, I'm going to I'm gonna make of you a great nation and I'm gonna bless you and I'm gonna bless all the people of the earth through you and through your children and through your offspring. And so God chose this man named Abraham and he gave him a son and that son had two sons but only one would be the inheritor of the promise that God made to Abraham and God gave that one son who was the inheritor of the promise and of the covenant. God gave him 12 sons from which we get the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And God, listen, God gave, listen, God gave to those 12 sons, he gave them multiple children, and he gave us and he gave to those children visions and revelations of himself that the world had never seen before. I mean, they, they saw the mountain as it quaked as Moses met with God. They saw the Red Sea part. They saw the manna fall from heaven. They saw the quail being blown in by an east wind from the Red Sea. They saw all of these things take place. They saw the walls of Jericho fall. They saw, listen, they saw the tablets that com communicated the law of God that was written by the very finger of God himself. Saw all of these things. And yet, and yet, if you study the Old Testament, you'll find that by and large, Israel's history is one of dismal failure. Even though they saw all of these things. God looks at the nation of Israel and look, listen to what he says to Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. I have seen this people. And behold, it is a stiff-necked people. That means it's stubborn. Let me alone 
that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of thee a nation mightier and greater than they. All of the advantages that Israel had, and God still looked down, and the record is this, you're still a mess. You're still a disaster. I've given you everything I possibly could, and look what you have done. You're stiff-necked to the point where I want to just destroy you and move on. God didn't do that, fortunately, but that's what he wanted to do. That was, the, that was the instinct, that was the desire that he had. And I just want you to know something. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he sat in the heavens and he observed all of these things. He observed Adam's fall and man's swift demise. And the eventual truth is this, that listen, blessed with the best of everything, man is still completely and totally helpless. And God understood that. Jesus understood that. He acknowledged that. You say, Maybe, maybe Israel needed better political leaders. Listen, Israel had the best political leader the world has ever seen. His name is Moses. The greatest leader of a nation the world has ever known. And yet, what were they under, under Moses? They were still a mess. Oh, they still accomplished some great things, but they were still a disaster. In fact, God's speaking to Moses in Deuteronomy 9 when he says, I just want to be done with them. Listen, the answer, listen, the answer is not a better, a better person to sit in the White House. That's, that's not your greatest need. The answer is that more money, children of Israel, they walked out of the nation of Egypt, and Egypt said, here, take all of our money, take all of our wealth, and you know what they did with that? They made a golden calf out of it. Your greatest need and the meaning of that greatest need is not going to be more money, it's not going to be more politics, it's not going to be better education. God revealed himself to the nation of Israel. He educated them as to who he was, and look where they, what they did with it. That, that's not what you need. What you need is you need eternal riches. You need forgiveness of sin, peace with God, and you need an eternal home in heaven. And that leads us to this final truth. You see, Jesus looked from heaven and he observed the needs that mankind had and his observation was they have these needs and he determined he was going to meet them, but now the question remains, does he have the ability to do it? Remember I told you a minute ago, my son would love a really expensive car and the only, the closest he's going to get is he's probably going to get a little, a little car he can play with, you know, run around in the living room floor. That's about as good as it's going to get. That, that's, that's the ability that I have to meet that need for him. I want you to know something. Jesus looked down from heaven and he said, man needs forgiveness of sin. Man needs peace with God. Man needs an eternal home in heaven. And Jesus said, I'm going to meet that need. As I said at the beginning of this message, he alone can do it. Number three, let me just share this with you. We'll be done. Christ's ability to meet our need. Going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 9, the Bible says, And ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Let's consider just briefly his wealth. Paul writes that he was rich. He was rich. What was he rich in? He was rich in eternal wealth and eternal riches. Not just, he was rich in the world. The Bible says that everything here is his. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. Oh, hey, listen, he had earthly wealth too. But listen, he had something way more important that can meet the need that you have and that I have, and that is that he had eternal wealth. He had, he had peace with God. He didn't need to be forgiven of his sin because he had no sin. And he had, listen, he had an eternal home in heaven. It's known as the Father's house. It's where he came from, and it's where he ascended back to. It's the place that he's preparing for all those who believe in him. I just want you to know something. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, was wealthy. But the Bible tells us, number two, that he was willing to become poor. He laid aside all of those things. He left the, he left the splendor of that eternal home in heaven. He came down here to dwell among men, and while he never sinned, the Bible indicates that when he hung on the cross, God took the sin of the world, your sin and my sin, and God placed it upon his shoulders. The Bible says that he became sin for us who knew no sin. That's him. He didn't know any sin, that you and I might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus became poor. He was willing to do that. He took your sin upon himself. He took my sin upon himself. He was made in the likeness of men. And by the way, as he hung on that cross, you know, the sky didn't just get dark because the storm blew through. No, no, the sky became dark because for the first time in the history of the world, in the first time in the history of eternity, God and God the Son, God the Father and God the Son were at war with one another. 
There was a missing piece there. I'm saying peace, P-E-A-C-E, that God the Son, because of his current state, bearing the sin of the world, God turned his back on him to the point where Jesus cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know why he did that? He, he experienced a time when he was not at peace with God so that he could guarantee you peace with God. He took your sin upon him who knew no sin so that you could have forgiveness of sin. He left the eternal home in heaven and all of the wealth and all of the wonder there. He chose to become poor so that someday you could inherit those things. Jesus did that for us. His wealth, his willingness to become poor. Notice thirdly, that through, through him, through his poverty, we become wealthy. Our wealth comes through his poverty. Christ as a poor man, a servant with no reputation. He resisted sin. He suffered and bled and died. He conquered death. He rose from the dead the third day, and he secured peace with God for us. Leading Paul to write in Romans 5, 1 and 2, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 1. 8 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. What I'm saying is this. Listen, those who believe the biblical account acknowledge that Jesus Christ, who was rich, became poor for us so that we through his poverty might be made rich. You know what Jesus has given to every one of us? Oh, you, you may get a new car this Christmas or you may not get a new car. You may get a new, a new pair of shoes, or uh, you may get, who knows, who knows what you might get this year at Christmas, but I want you to know something. Here's what Christ has given to every man. He has given us of his wealth. Every last one of us. And Christ has given us of his wealth. How can you secure that? You can secure that by trusting and believing in him. And can I say that as a saved man, all of Christ's riches can be given to us I am rich, listen, I am rich today, not in worldly goods. I live in a simple neighborhood, drive a pretty simple car, wear fairly simple clothes, and dine at fairly simple restaurants, but I am rich today. I, I, have, a, I have a richness, a wealth that the world knows little about. It's a spiritual wealth that I have, and I want you to know you can have it just as well. 